Welcome back to the special holiday edition of Noir Alley. I'm your host, Eddie Muller. And if you've already had your fill of jolliness this month, I've got just the antidote. Blast of Silence, a grim and gritty noir from 1961. It's either one of the last films of the original noir era or one of the first examples of what would later be called neo-noir. Either way, it is a stark and compelling film, a unique example of high-risk, low-budget independent filmmaking. The picture was written and directed by native New Yorker Alan Barron, who also stars in it as Frankie Bono, a taciturn hitman from Cleveland who comes to Manhattan during the Christmas season to fulfill a contract. This being noir, things do not go smoothly. As film critic Terrence Rafferty says, Blast of Silence is, hands down, the best movie ever about a common, important, and unjustly neglected American experience, the really bad business trip. This was Barron's first film, and to say he made it on a shoestring is understating it. He started with only $2,800, just enough to shoot and process some test footage. Those few hundred feet of film helped him secure the rest of the budget, a mere $18,000. That's right, the entire film was made for just over 20 grand. Barron was savvy and resourceful, starting with the story. Movies about hitmen can be made on shoestrings. The character is isolated, doesn't say much, and spends most of the story either killing time or stalking the target, things that can be rendered cinematically and without spending much money. Barron had no filmmaking experience, but he had worked as a comic book artist, so the rudiments of composition and editing were second nature to him. He approached movie making purely on instinct, working with borrowed equipment and shooting most everything in actual New York locations without permits, a time-honored tradition amongst young filmmakers like Stanley Kubrick, Irving Lerner, and Paul Wenkos, whose low-budget features, Killer's Kiss, Murder by Contract, and the burglar share the same DYI DNA as Blast of Silence. It was not Barron's intention to play the hired killer. He had written the part specifically for a buddy, an actor he'd met doing summer stock theater, Peter Falk. But as luck would have it, Falk got an offer that paid actual money, playing mob stoolie Abe Rellis in Murder Incorporated, released the same year as Blast of Silence. Now, that test footage I mentioned earlier was actually Barron's screen test. Shots of him walking through Grand Central Station and talking on pay phones. And of course, all those shots end up in the final film. Nothing can be wasted when working with a budget this stingy. Another unique aspect of Blast of Silence is its voiceover narration. Voiceovers were a venerable part of the film noir lexicon but Barron gives it a twist. This is the only one I've ever heard delivered in the second person. Veteran actor Lionel Stander serves as Frankie Bono's disembodied conscience, or at least some sort of omnipotent noir deity who stands watch over angst-fueled assassins. Stander did the job for 500 bucks uncredited. It would have cost Barron an additional 500 bucks to use Stander's name in the credits. The actor had been blacklisted in the early 1950s, and in an odd coincidence, the voiceover narration was scripted by another blacklistee, screenwriter Waldo Salt. It was added after the film was edited to make it feel more cohesive. It is truly one of a kind in concept, language, and delivery. Also featuring Molly McCarthy, Larry Tucker, and lots of Alan Barron's friends and family working for nothing, here is one of my favorite Christmas films, Blast of Silence. A rare and remarkable film in my estimation, one that symbolically takes its angry and alienated baby boy protagonist from birth to death. Frankie's death scene has to be one of the harshest ever in a crime movie. It was filmed on the Jamaica Bay estuary at the tip of Long Island 
Known as the Old Mill, the place was long rumored to be a dumping ground for victims of the mob. Director Alan Barron chose it precisely for that reason. And because it was so isolated, they could get in a full day's shooting without permits. What wasn't expected was the hurricane and snowstorm, which made the scene even more effective and more treacherous to shoot. Barron did his own stunts, of course, including Frankie's one-take death drop into the freezing bay. It's truly one of the coldest, bleakest endings in noir. Now, an odd connection between Blast of Silence and classic Hollywood is the camera equipment used to make this film. Barron had worked as a crew member on Errol Flynn's last movie, a crazy independent film shot in 1959 called Cuban Rebel Girls. It was made on location in Havana during the revolution, and the filmmakers had to flee the country in a hurry, leaving the equipment behind. Barron made a deal with the producer that if he smuggled himself into Cuba and smuggled out the gear, he could use it free of charge to shoot his first movie. Complicating things even further was the fact that Barron was a wanted man in Cuba. He accidentally shot and wounded a local man during the making of Cuban Rebel Girls, and he unwittingly slept with the girlfriend of a local gangster. Unlike his screen avatar, Barron made it out of his dangerous assignment intact. Once Blast of Silence was completed, Barron agreed to a bad distribution deal with Universal, which bought the film in perpetuity for only $50,000. At that point, there was no way Barron could have known that his movie would eventually be a cult classic. It steadily earned money for Universal over seven decades, but Barron hasn't seen a nickel of it. It did, however, earn him a directing gig with Warner Brothers, starting Barron on a long career, mostly as a television director. Another guy who got a jump start from this film was Larry Tucker, who played Big Ralph. Tucker was mainly a comedy writer. He'd provided material for topical comedian Mort Saul, and he'd become a writing partner of director Paul Mazursky. Their script for Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice was nominated for an Oscar in 1971. One of Tucker's few other acting roles was as the inmate Pagliacci in Sam Fuller's 1963 psychodrama, Shock Corridor. As for Molly McCarthy, prior to this, she'd only made one other movie, the terrific 1959 heist picture, The Great St. Louis Bank Robbery, where she starred opposite a young Steve McQueen. She was in lots of TV shows in the early 60s, but didn't make any more movies until the 80s. In all three, she lent support to the same star, Matt Dillon, Over the Edge, Liar's Moon, and The Flamingo Kid. After that, she quit for good. Back in 2013, Alan Barron was my special guest at a Noir City show in San Francisco. The robust 86-year-old director received a rousing ovation from a whole new generation following a screening of Blast of Silence. We paid Alan tribute by bestowing on him a brand new version of the stingy-brimmed fedora he wore in the film. No Christmas Day show next week as Noir Alley steps aside for a full day of holiday programming. But I'll be back on New Year's Day with a very appropriate film, Repeat Performance, in which Joan Leslie gets her New Year's Eve wish, reliving the previous year to avoid committing murder. It's a cross between film noir and the Twilight Zone, and it's been restored by my Film Noir Foundation to its original dark luster. Happy holidays, everybody. Stay safe, and I'll see you back here in two weeks to ring in another year of Noir Alley.